Thank you for that. That was a great way to uh, begin our next discussion. Um, before I introduce the panelists, let me just tell you a little bit about who I am and why I'm up here. My name is Ian Urbina. I'm a reporter for the New York Times, uh, an investigative reporter. I've been at the New York Times for about two decades, and uh, for the past five years, I've been working on a series called The Outlaw Ocean. Uh, it began as a series in the newspaper and grew beyond those bounds into a book project and a Netflix Leo DiCaprio movie project and continues to grow. And that growth is not testament to any talent of mine. Um, I'm uh, chagrined to say it really is uh, indicative of uh, the urgency of the topic uh, and the diversity of the problems that exist out there. Uh, the series was focused on lawlessness at sea and aimed to show the public the broad range of problems that exist offshore. Uh, and it spanned from a look at human slavery on fishing ships to illegal fishing to the intentional dumping of oil at sea to arms trafficking uh, and a range of other topics, as well as some that particularly pertain to today, which were these faceless uh, topics like acidification and, and sea temperature rise, um, uh, which are crimes in and of themselves uh, and in some ways the most acute ones. Um, and in that reporting, uh, you know, running around the globe for those years uh, and still, I kept coming in touch with the work of and the actual individuals of our two panelists today. Um, uh, so let me introduce them and tell you a little bit about what they do. But I want to read this part so I don't mess it up. Um, so we have two panelists. One is from Tiffany's and the other is from Global Fishing Watch. Since its founding over 180 years ago, Tiffany and Company has taken pride in crafting beautiful jewelry that its customers pass down for generations. Tiffany and Company has long considered how its business affects society and the environment with a focus over the past two decades on responsible sourcing, philanthropy, and environmental conservation. One way that Tiffany addresses these topics is through the Tiffany and Company Foundation, whose mission is to preserve the world's most treasured seascapes and landscapes. Anissa Camadoli Costa is a sustainability executive, philanthropy expert, and coalition builder. She's the chairwoman and president of the Tiffany and & Company and chief sustainability officer of Tiffany & Company, holding two distinct yet synergistic roles that embody Tiffany's long-standing commitment to environmental and social responsibility. Global Fishing Watch is an independent, international, nonprofit organization promoting ocean sustainability through greater transparency. The NGO uses cutting edge technology to visualize, track, and share data about global fishing activity in near real time and for free. Global Fishing Watch was originally set up in 2015 through a collaboration between three partners, Oceana, an international ocean conservation organization, SkyTruth, experts in using satellite technology to protect the environment, and Google, who provide the tools for processing big data. Tony Long became the first permanent CEO of Global Fishing Watch in September 2017. Prior to joining the organization, Tony directed Pew Charitable Trust and Illegal Fishing Program. And before that was a commander in the Royal British Navy, where he spent 27 years and served on the first Sea Lords strategy team. Let's welcome those guests. <laughs> This is a meeting of old friends. Um, <laughs> so, Anissa, I want to start with you. Um, I know that Tiffany has three main approaches to tackling some of these issues. Raise public awareness, build collaboration between stakeholders, and leverage the Tiffany brand to foster change within the industry. Um, I'm most aware of your work in the, with Coral Reef um, conservation, if you could just 
explain that work a little bit, the collaboration you do in that space of ocean conservation generally? Absolutely. Thank you, Ian. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I just have to start off by saying that it's such a pleasure to be here and to be able to have a conversation on this topic. And I also wanted to start off by saying that from the Tiffany & Company perspective, we certainly understand that to run a successful business, to run a thriving business, we need to ensure that we have thriving local communities, thriving ecosystems, and a thriving planet. And we're certainly not alone when it comes to business understanding that need, but I think that's sort of a fundamental starting point. Everybody, every business, every government, every civil society organization has a role to play when it comes to conserving the ocean and therefore influencing climate change. And from the Tiffany & Company perspective, we have taken certain ways to address these issues from a core business stance. So first and foremost, we have a climate strategy um, when it comes to how we're addressing our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we have signed on to be a net zero company and we certainly have short and medium term strategies to address this longer term goal. We're committed, as you mentioned, to using the power of the Tiffany Voice and our brand to speak out on issues that are important to us, such as climate action now. Um, we were very vocal in terms of advocating for the U.S. to remain in the Paris Climate Agreement um, with President Trump earlier on. Um, we're also advocating within the jewelry industry for coral conservation and trying to educate about the importance of coral. I know that many people in the room today will know that coral serves as the cornerstone for healthy oceans. And yet, coral is still widely used in the jewelry and the home decor industry. Over a decade ago, well over a decade ago, Tiffany and Company decided to stop using coral in our collections because we realized that using coral was not sustainable for the coral species, for the oceans, and therefore for the planet. But we didn't stop there. Um, through the Tiffany and Company Foundation, we work really collaboratively, both formally and informally, um, on a variety of wider, broader ocean issues because we again understand that critical link between the oceans and climate. And maybe I'll just mention two of the ways that we work collaboratively. The first is working with the Paul G. Allen Philanthropies and actually Bloomberg Philanthropies on an innovative project called 50 Reefs. 50 Reefs has worked to identify global reef ecosystems that are more resilient to climate change and therefore we're hoping obviously will help to sustain the species going forward in time. And another initiative that we have been quite involved with is Oceans 5. Oceans 5 is a funders collaborative um, where the mission simply is to protect the world's oceans. Um, we have been part of Oceans 5, um, which focuses on IUU fishing, which Tony I know is going to speak to shortly, and also the creation of marine protected areas and enforcement of marine protected areas. And you mentioned earlier, I think, that the oceans cover over two thirds of the planet. And despite that fact, less than 4% of the world's oceans are fully protected. Less than 4%. That is an astounding number, I think. And it's a number that we need to increase. I think that, thankfully, through a lot of hard work over the last five or so years, a lot of governments have come together to create new marine protected areas and to increase already existing marine protected areas. And this is what's important because to hit the goal of 30% of oceans being conserved by 2030, which is what most scientists agree is the bare minimum to ensure that the oceans have the time to rejuvenate so that fish populations can repopulate, so that biodiversity can thrive again. But I think no matter what issue we're working on within this space, it's clear that no one business can tackle this alone, no one country, no one nonprofit organization. So partnership is key, having a shared vision and collaborating. Mm -hmm. um, and just briefly, um, you know, one of the things I was struck by, and this is perhaps a self-serving comment, I'll say up front, but um, was, you know, the planet is two-thirds water, um, and yet there's very little storytelling, journalism sort of explanation coming out of that space, about that space. I do feel like that's a severe problem in terms of prodding the sort of hearts and mind urgency that the public and, you know, decision makers need to have about the space. Um, I know that you're involved in trying to correct that, so just speak if you would for a second about your role within the journalism space. 
Absolutely. So I think you're absolutely correct. If things are out of sight, unfortunately, they are out of mind. And I really believe that people need to experience what is at risk of being lost in order to become more passionate advocates for what needs to be protected. And so to that end, we have focused on consumer awareness and constituency building efforts. Two recent films that we funded actually that were quite innovative. Um, one was to, um, one was for Chasing Coral. Chasing Coral is a documentary that's available on Netflix. And what Chasing Coral does is to bring the viewer really up close and to be able to see the impacts of climate change on coral reef ecosystems. So thanks to time lapse, the viewer can actually just see again what is happening underneath the water. And this is something that the imagery is really striking and it's something that if you're able to see the film, it really won't leave you. The second film that we funded recently is through Conservation International. It's a virtual reality film called Valens Reef. And what Valens Reef does is it transports the viewer um, in virtual reality and transports you all the way to Raja Ampat, Indonesia. And this is an area that was once on the brink of destruction. However, thanks to the work of the local community, NGOs, and the government, it's now one of the most pristine marine ecosystems out there. And I think you know many of us in the room are probably divers, or at least we travel quite often. I think that we have to remember that many people aren't able to travel so far. Many people aren't able to have the to, to experience the the beauty, right, of diving and being underwater. So, Valens Reef sort of shows that that positive impact. And I think that it's really important to be able to view the hope and the positive stories alongside understanding the stark realities of what's happening to our oceans because of climate change. I would add a point that we were discussing before, which is that when it comes to sort of promoting um, a certain issue, uh, even within the ocean space, coral is one of the tougher ones um, to, to tell stories about and to get people excited about, um, uh, even harder than fish, which are hard in and of themselves. Um, Tony, I think of you as sort of way above the water line, satellites, big data, sort of eyes in the sky looking at what's happening on the water and, and how that might empower enforcement. But if you would just sort of give me a brief, and ignore the clock because we're way behind, um, uh, give me a brief um, <clears throat> description of, of when Global Fishing Watch started and what data it uses to do what. It won't take me too long to explain the, the background to Global Fishing Watch. It's actually to say the technology is now becoming so much more accessible and so much more affordable, all of a sudden we, we can really get a good idea of what, what's out there. And as uh, Mike Bloomberg said at the start, if you can't uh, measure it, you can't manage it. And, and as we used to say uh, in, the, in the Navy, what, what's beyond the beach is sort of out of sight and out of mind. And what we're trying to do with Global Fishing Watch is place what's happening on our oceans in a clear easily understandable, highly visualized uh, map, uh, which you can all access online for free. Uh, before Global Fishing Watch, there was nothing, which sounds kind of dramatic, but that's the case. There was, there was no real public understanding of what, what fishing vessels are doing out on the ocean. And we, we started to draw on different uh, technologies, which um, the first one was a system called AIS. This is a, a system that ships use in order to avoid colliding with each other, but actually it's very easily accessible. And very quickly, we had 60,000 vessels in the system. And then we noticed that some of them lied or maybe turned it off or manipulated the data. So we started using the big data that Google gave us the power to do to understand exactly what the patterns of movement from those signals told us. And we could see trawlers. We can see the vessels that use Persein, the big purses of, that, that gather in the fish. And the long liners were those huge 40 mile long lines with thousands of hooks. And we can tell that they're doing that. So we know they're fishing. Um, but that was only so much. Uh, the interesting piece here, Ian, is, as we were talking before, the, the public information is not, not enough, and the governments have a lot of information. And a lot of people think that information is, is power. Well, it's, it's only power if you use it appropriately. And in the case of fishing, you really do need to share that data to make the most of it. So Indonesia, through Minister Puja Stuti, um, she stepped right up into the fore uh, in 2017 and shared their private proprietary data with Global Fishing Watch, adding 5,000 more tracks to, to Global Fishing Watch. And that started a movement. Peru joined last year. They've shared their uh, proprietary data into the system, another 1,500 tracks. We've got Costa Rica have lined up with a letter of intent to share their data. And then only this week, Panama, one of the biggest flags in the world, have made a commitment 
to consider, I'll say consider because I don't want to overstate it, but they look very positive that they're going to put their data into Global Fishing Watch, which will be huge. And then yesterday from Namibia, we received the first data to test how they're sharing the data. So what's, what Minister Susi did is start a movement of, of public and open data, mm. and it's important. And, and I can speak from firsthand experience, you know, um, as a storyteller and investigative journalist, um, there are life and death um, uh, issues that play out. Uh, and we were able, and AP and many others, were able to um, tell these stories of human slavery or arms trafficking or who was dumping oil where and where did they disappear to only by way of the data that you guys have been pulling together and making public. Um, but so on a meta level, though, you've crunched all the data and worked with universities and come up with some interesting broad findings about who's doing what, if you touch on that. Yeah, the, so the, 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 one of the best reactions of having this data out into the public sphere is people can access it. So we've found some of the best universities in the world have started to draw on this data. Um, and they can measure things now. So we, we know that over 50% of the fishing that happens on the high seas, that ungoverned space, would be unprofitable without subsidies or bonded labor. We know that 85% of the fishing that happens on the high seas are by the richest states, and most of that is China and Taiwan. Um, we know that if we're going to address issues on the high seas, we need to work with around five states, uh, China, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea. I always forget, the, they always remember which way around, Spain. They're always Spain. Why do I forget Spain? Mm -hmm. um, so, so you know, these sort of measurements are there. And you mentioned bonded labor. We, we think you can actually look at the way a vessel uh, behaves, and it can give you a risk indicator of whether that vessel is likely to have human rights issues on board. I mean, just take the straightforward example. If a vessel goes to sea for hundreds of days at a time and doesn't come back to port, I want some guarantees to know that those crews have had chance to roll on and move around. Mm -hmm. But there, there's indications that they don't. They're on, they're on these vessels for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And you've seen from your report that that, that is the case. So we would like to use the technology um, to drive that. There's, there's one other thing I, I just want to reiterate. We can't do it alone. So although I'm representing Global Fishing Watch here, and I'm very proud of what Global Fishing Watch is doing, I also recognize that there's a lot of other people doing work in the same sphere. And we need to sort of bring it together. So uh, military background, slightly biased in what I know the militaries are capable of. I've been pushing hard for the governments of the world to share data that ordinarily they wouldn't share. There's a thing in the military called a tear line, mm -hmm. where you sort of rip it off and slowly but surely, only the very top people get all of the information, but those of us down the bottom got an indication. And we're, we're driving that change. So the US Coast Guard has recognized that. And we announced a partnership today with the US Coast Guard in order to share information and do research on where the illegal fishing hotspots probably are. And we need to drive that change as well. Mm -hmm. I suppose one of the, the final thing I should say is, is you know, Bloomberg's philanthropies are huge supporters of, of Global Fishing Watch. And we've also got support from Oceans 5 and Marissa Foundation. In fact, if you look on the website, we've now got 11 different philanthropies helping us. But I don't believe it's, it's those private foundations that should be funding something like this. Fish are a public resource. It's a public. Um, uh, it should be public knowledge of who's taking what from where, and I think government should be held responsible. Um, I was lucky enough to be at the G7 with the, with the, the Canadians, and they've pledged support to, to Global Fishing Watch, the first government to do so. Uh, we've also got Japan have signed an MOU with us, which I'm hoping will develop into similar to support like we've received or will receive from Canada. But actually, I'm pressuring the whole group of seven. You know, they can afford to have something like Global Fisher Watch funded and available for public use. And I think people could stand up and take that responsibility. And I, I would just say that um, at the end of the day, this is an event about climate change. And here we are talking about fish and coral. And so to connect the two, I think, is to point out, number one, what you said earlier, that we live on an ocean planet, two thirds water. Um, Number two, these are cliches, but need to be mentioned. You know, every second breath we breathe, the temperature stabilizer of the planet are the oceans or is the ocean. Um, and so monitoring, tracking, policing, protecting, conserving the health of the key coral, you know, the canary in the coal mine corals or the fishing activity happening on the seas uh, are going to be essential to any climate change strategy. So um, I think that's sort of the the sort of big takeaway point. But thank you so much for your time. Um, and uh, um, I think we will next hear from a panel on energy. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Thank you very much.